Hey gamers, welcome to another episode of Bonus XP. Today we are talking about the polarizing cult classic title, Parasite Eve 2. And with me today, I have Discord member Asters. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So I love bringing on Discord members and having conversations with them about games and uh, just like catch up on it. I think this was a you just beat Parasite Eve 1 and I'm like, you should 100% play the second one, right? Like, that's how this all went down? Yes, yes. I just I just randomly wanted to pick it up again after uh, failing miserably in the park on Parasite Eve one years ago. And then, yeah, just started getting through it. And then you were like, yeah, you should play too. And then I was like, yeah, that'll be fun and not have any caveats at all. Yeah, <laughs> aside from... Half of the chat being like, no, <laughs> and me being like, but, but yes. <laughs> um, so I want to hear your opinions, obviously, as we go through and we talk about everything. But um, I think when we were setting this up, you said that you knew a little bit of the development history of this game. And I think there are a lot of things that I probably didn't know. So I'd love if you would like take the reins on that but before that i want to preface we plan on potentially doing a parasite eve one video so we're not going to do so much of a direct comparison in this video just for the sake of like giving this game its time and space uh, like obviously you can't talk about the second one without talking about the first one somewhat right. but we are going to hit that first game i think in a future episode too so if we're not talking up as much as you want about how great the first one was just wait like it'll it'll get there but yeah what kinds of things do you know about the development history for this and like why it's so different from the original yes before we get into that though i know we don't typically do cold opens for uh bonus xps but i did think of one that i would have loved to do that oh yeah shoot do best it best grown from you so it would have been something like these tank controls are mitochondri unbelievable Hey, it's okay. <laughs> No, no. Okay, well, I think we can rescind your application to any future RPG Great, thanks for episodes. having me on. It was yeah. great. <laughs> and that's the episode. All right. Um, hey, at, le at least you're thinking. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so uh, in doing my own research after doing my first playthrough um, of Parasite Eve 2, I... Uh, went through a few. Oh, hang different... on. Preface this because this is officially your first time playing it ever. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. This was so. Yeah, I had picked up Parasite Eve one a couple of times. This was the first one. I first time I had ever touched it. Literally knew nothing about it. Just went into it assuming it would be more of the same. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, very so, very different. So one of the the big things I found out is that around this time. Square was going through a lot. Um, Sakaguchi was basically being spread very thin, and he was getting pulled in all of these different directions. Um, a lot of stuff that was being worked on around the same time was, one, they were getting ready for the launch of the PS2. Um, which right, because was... this is a, a, this is definitely end cycle PS1. Oh, yes, when big time. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tetsuya Nomura, who had done the character designs and everything for the first Parasite Eve, um, got pulled along with the, uh, the story writer who is escaping me off the top of my head, but they were pulled onto uh, the very infamous The Bouncer. Um, oh, so, okay. so, so we lost, we lost, uh, we lost them for Parasite Eve 2 to the bouncer, um, which if anybody knows about the development and release of that game, there's not much to be said. Also, uh, three, three specific games that were being worked on without direct input from Sakaguchi was Xenogears, Chrono Cross, and Final Fantasy VIII which is very interesting considering all three of those games if if i'm not wrong have relatively troubled development histories by the end there's a lot of um contention with fans about the endings of those games and kind yeah, of yeah i think systems maybe not for final fantasy 8 like i know final fantasy 8 gets weird but i would also say it still feels relatively like a complete game at least from mm -hmm. the player's standpoint but chrono cross and um Xenogears, definitely the opposite. We're like, Chrono Cross doesn't feel like a Chrono Trigger game until the last third, 
And it's almost like you're smashing them together in like a really awkward, awkward way. And then Xenogears, everybody kind of knows about how the the yeah. second disc is just you're basically sitting in a chair watching narrative beats happen, and then you get to play a small snippet. So I, I believe that for like for most of them, yeah. When that's that's a that's a lot of game for them yeah, to be working which, on all at the same time. And on top of that, uh, the big the big thing that I realized is um, during this time, Sakaguchi was very heavily involved with um, the development of uh, my second favorite Steve Buscemi movie, Final Fantasy Spirits Within. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, so... so this is, a, this is really just like... <laughs> a nightmare of time mm -hmm. okay well yeah. this 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 paints a lot of pictures and i think that kind of gives uh people an idea of what's going on at the time when this game was being created and being someone who actually had the privilege of playing this game when it came out i think some of the obvious things that you see when you're noticing it is how it is a lot more survival horror like than the first one um, where yes. I think the first one was kind of like uniquely an RPG in its own way. I feel like this one was definitely emulating what we were seeing from games like Resident Evil and Silent Hill at the time. Um, did you kind of notice that? Yes, there's there's actually a very specific reason for that. And that's because, um, back to Sakaguchi for a second, a lot of his policies on specifically sequels for Square um, were very rigid in that very rarely did games get sequels, like direct sequels. Basically what he wanted was he wanted teams who were working on games, after that game cleared, he wanted to encourage those teams to branch out into different projects and kind of just, you know, kind of get themselves meshed in with all different kinds of um, work. I'm probably wrong about this, but I can't think of another Square Enix game that had a direct sequel up to this I don't, this point. I don't think like, it I was think until this... Final Fantasy X-2. Right, so I think, yeah. could, th could this be technically the first Square Enix sequel? So, it's funny that you asked that because this was actually, what I also found out, supposed to be a spin-off of Parasite Eve and not oh. a direct sequel. It was actually supposed to feature um, Kyle Madigan as a main character, not involve Aya at all. Interesting. Um, and on top of that, they brought in um, a, a man named Kenichi Awao, who actually did a lot of the story writing for the first Resident Evil game. Like most of most most of the writing for a lot of that game was from him and that game probably would not have been as much of a landmark release if it weren't for him. Specifically the infamous like itchy scratchy note that or was itchy, all itchy, him. itchy tasty. Yeah, itch, itchy tasty. Yes, yes, yes. That was all him. And so they brought him on when he was still... Obviously, he worked on that game, um, but they specifically brought him on to head, the, head Parasite Eve 2 because of his experience with Resident Evil 1 and wanted it to have more of a heavy survival horror um, influence, which is why Parasite Eve 2 ended up the way that it did. I'm not really sure where in development they switched from making it a spinoff into a direct sequel. I'm wondering if they were just looking at would something like that sell? I mean, you have, to, you have to think about, um, you know, how many different IPs Square Enix had going on at the time because being at the end of the PS1, there were a ton. And uh, also... Would a game like that sell, especially coming off of how much the people who played Parasite Eve 1 loved Parasite Eve 1, would they want to open themselves up to a completely new playable character mm -hmm. when it feels like Aya's, Aya's journey is not completely done? So uh, I, I get like I get why this is what we got. I think... Um, Personally, I really like this game. I know if and you know this from just kind of like getting prepared and getting ready, or even just from what people say, this is not a revered game. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, which, I mean, like, I will concede and say I understand why people wouldn't like this game, but 
Um, I think the people who actually take the time and give it the patience to do it, especially if you like survival horror games, I think you would get a lot out of this game because there weren't many survival horror games that were survival horror RPGs that were also like semi-action. So I personally think this game has a lot of success in what it's trying to do, but I also like, agree that like it has its holes and uh, there, I understand why people wouldn't like it. Don't we all? Don't we all? And like most holes, <laughs> we have to fill them with things like tank controls, which oh. is probably, let's actually start with combat first, especially, you know, you're okay. thinking about survival horrors. We're thinking about uh, what, how we play the game and what we do. Um, so combat and tank controls. Um, one thing I want to talk about, and I know that there's such a gripe about tank controls, and I want to set this up to the juxtaposition of the setting because we're still in pre-rendered background land for Square Enix when we're talking about this game. Mm -hmm. I miss pre-rendered backgrounds because I think you have this very like solid, high detail background that you don't get in a lot of games, especially when you go into the full 3D space where a camera is like over your shoulder following you around. I feel like we tend to get a lot of quality dips when we, especially at that time, but you don't have that for as much for pre-rendered backgrounds. And I think that's why we have this game having tank controls um, because it would be impossible to have this level of detail at the time and have a free moving character where like, you know, you just hit this direction and they go, especially with all the transitions that happen between screens. Yeah. I, I completely agree with all of that. Like I love pre-rendered backgrounds. I, it just adds so much character and so much ambience to, you know, uh, a locale. Um, and I, I, I will say it, the tank controls were less of an oh god i hate tank controls once i first realized because you you saw you saw in the in the um in the discord once i booted up uh parasite eve 2 I was like yeah i'm starting parasite eve 2 and then you just see, like minutes later no! yeah. <laughs> and um my dismay at uh you know trying to move aya with the uh control sticks on my ps vita that i was uh, emulating it on and just my dismay at oh no oh no she's rotating oh god oh, do you know no. <laughs> know my my trick for tank controls mm -hmm. is that like i just pretend the character is a car <laughs> like like legitimately because i mean like most people know how to drive of course, so yeah. Just like, just move yourself like a car, and you're good. And I think like if you do that, you will have zero <laughs> problems dodging monsters and getting where you need to go. So is that how you get out of your parallel parking spot? You just uh, rotate your car uh, 45 degrees out of the parking spot, and then uh... <laughs> there is no parallel parking in survival horrors. <laughs> um, but, I mean, but parallel yeah. park the shotgun in your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was less. Um, that I don't like tank controls because I've played game with tank with tank controls. I've played, um, I think the one that I'm used to the most, um, cause I believe the, uh, the GameCube Resident Evil one remake was still tank controls. Was it not? Yeah. Resident yes. Evil was tank controls. Yeah. I think he, even Resident Evil four, um, technically still, yes, yes, yeah, it is. Yes. Technically... And so, and I love both those games and I played through them and I really enjoyed them. And especially, you know, once I got used to, um, those controls, which were very clearly made for the rest of the game, I got super used to them and have, and honestly wouldn't have them any other way. That being said, um, for Parasite Eve 2, it was more so, yeah, that juxtaposition of playing through the first Parasite Eve, getting so used to not only having that free movement of Aya, mm -hmm. but seeing her and seeing her characterized as a human being with free movement. Um, and then to start up the second game and then see her move in this very robotic fashion um, in comparison um, felt very jarring just because, well, yeah. Let's talk about that because I feel like this kind of goes into combat field too a little mm -hmm. bit where, again, trying not to compare too much, but you can't completely compare or you can't completely avoid comparing. Um, 
in the original game, you got into encounters, but it never really felt like um, the spaces were realistic or that the encounters were curated around the space. Oh, for and sure. I, and I think that's why I like not all encounters because like there are some times where you're playing Parasite 2 and you're like the tiniest room and you're like, how the fuck yeah. am I supposed to do anything here? But um, I feel like a lot of the times the space is curated the combat is curated around the space. Um, whether that's environmental things that you can use to your advantage or disadvantage or like whatever. And um, one didn't have that. And I, I, I feel like it was just kind of like it's cool that this is an action game where you can move around and dodge hits and you have more of that free flowing nature but it also just felt like it was monster dependent not like thinking of where i am too and when we're talking about parasite Eve 2 you know you have those monsters where they dash at you mm -hmm. and if you like move out of the way at the time where they smack into the wall they take damage and they fall over and you yes. can capitalize on that and i think it's those little things that um Agreeing with you, free movement always feels good, but um, there were a lot of things that didn't make combat feel any different. Like, it was always dodge and shoot, dodge and shoot, dodge and shoot. For sure, one. For now sure. there's a little bit more of a strategy to it, but what what did you think about, like, the combat feel in terms of that? Like, was were the, were the tank controls and everything so hard that you couldn't get past it, or was it still, like, d different but acceptable so i was thinking about this actual specific question yesterday um and what i've come to at this point is there is getting used to controls that the game has like kind of catered to the experience to like learn and get used to and then there are controls that never ever get to the point of truly feeling great but you kind of just get used to how not great they feel and sure. that's kind of that's kind of how i ended up with parasite eve 2 when i first started in the beginning i was definitely very frustrated it was very foreign um having you know having me jump from p uh, pe1 um aya to pe2 aya was uh was very strange there, there were so, some subtle things that were really annoying like if you lock on which blessing that they give you a lock on feature but if you are locked on and you're trying to run away you're still like magnetically pulled to the direction that of that the was enemy. one of my big problems with yeah it, is that... so they're like, there are little things like that or if you're trying to aim your spells you know your uh your parasite energy uh, um, a, a, bi a big problem with 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 my experience was um with the auto lock on um if you're trying to run away and then you relock on aya does this painfully slow shift and rotate to face the enemy again and you can still shoot while you are locked on but not fully facing and she will just whatever direction she is pointing at at the time during that rotation she will shoot so if you were well, kind the, of the way around that is to not hold the aim button because that's that's just dependent on your the weapon you're using well, you're probably I using just, a heavy I just ass mean weapon in, in, the, in the situation where you know you're in the you're heat panicking of, well you're yeah. in the heat of battle an enemy is kind of coming upon you and you're in the middle of that slow rotation and you you're basically just trying to get as close as you can to where those shots will hit i think if they had implemented a quick turn like they had in the early resident evil games i think that would have improved combat like exponentially so well are you putting modern standards on this though or are you thinking of the context of when it came out because obviously like yeah if we're going to talk about getting joy of a game you have to think about like yeah this game can be a chore because some games do it so much better but also thinking about it this came out around the same time that resident evil 3 came out it took a resident evil capcom three games to get a good feel of mobility because jill in original re3 finally could like curb a zombie if it came to grab her i think mm -hmm. that was the first game where you could quick turn i don't think i believe you could, so i don't think you could quick turn i know you couldn't quick turn in one i don't think you could in original two um so while i agree like there well, are a lot this of things game, that... this game came out uh basically what 99 um 
I believe. Yeah, and, and Resident, Resident Evil, Evil 3 came out, came out in 99 as well. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I guess it's a little bit of imposing modern sins, but I think we had the technology and the... Um, I think we could have had the foresight to implement something that could have just made that auto lock a little bit faster when you're sure. not facing an enemy. Oh, well, and I think having so many targets too, because usually when you're playing yeah. something like Resident Evil, it's very rare that you have more than two targets in a way, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, especially like if they're threatening targets, but a game like this, you'd have like eight or nine, not thinking about like, I need to swap between them easily because you can swap between them. Usually it was like, I just need to nuke these as fast as possible. And and like another big thing, um, which if I'm not wrong, a lot of the earlier uh, Resident Evils for the most part, actually, honestly, like for them, I want to say besides like, I don't know, like dogs or something, um, Resident Evil mostly had relatively slower lumbering enemies, if I'm not wrong. Would were yeah, it, Eve it really just the zombies because everything else like is pretty fast. In each game, they have like their fair share of fast creatures. It's I think it's just exclusively the zombies that are sluggish. That's fair. That just more yeah. so speaks to my inexperience with those older games, which I definitely want to change soon. But that being said, I definitely felt like the clunkiness of um specifically parasite eve 2's tank controls not tank controls in general um combined with just kind of it really did feel like a good amount of enemies either were fast or had access to a lot of either long range um like spell type attacks or projectiles or could reach out to you further than you were relatively safe to kind of like be close to them so that you could get some shots in without having to worry about getting hit sure and i think some of it comes in a balance too like if you compare other survival horrors you have your items and that's it and one of the things that makes this game unique is the fact that you basically have magic like you can curate how uh, aya is built in so many different ways whether that's what she has equipped weapons armor items that can give benefits items yes. that heal um and the spells that you have that i think so it's when you get hit and it feels a little cheap it's a little less cheap because you know how readily available you can recoup versus in a game like resident evil you know like every shot that you're taking matters oh, for absolutely. the most part yeah you know like you're discouraged from fighting in a game like this you're encouraged from fighting they give you unlimited ammo you can go back and restock uh from an ammo crate basically at any point and oh yeah it's definitely a lot more generous in that degree and ending my gripes with tank controls at this point I do appreciate that, you know, with the, with the combat of PE2, if this is how it has to be, I do like to do my best to see the best in things. And I do appreciate that a lot of small things in combat encounters do give it a much more strategic element than the first game. Strategic reloading, strategic switching um, on targets because certain targets will... Um, fall over or get stunned um, after a certain amount of shots so that you can then switch to another target while one is down and just kind of like adding the PE abilities with like crowd control abilities. Yeah, or, wh or where you shoot them or, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you, like you said, timing a flashlight burst as they're jumping at you stuns Absolutely. them. Like there's a lot of little like cool things that if you dig into it. Speaking of a lot of little cool things too, um, I always gush about this. I know it's the silliest thing. I think I want to shift over to setting now and kind of like mm -hmm. the locales and how they're built and how that affects the pacing and whatnot. There is a lot. First of all, we don't get many games in modern society. Um, oh, for so sure. anytime we see a game like that, when it has RPG elements, I should say, um, I am drawn to it. This game does so many little things that I just think are so neat. Like, um, it's obviously reflecting a survival horror. We don't have a lot of big story elements or characterization, but Aya can interact with a lot of different things. Oh, and yeah. She, I love that. She, yes. And she gives her own commentary 
about it, uh, whether it's things about her or things about the world or touching on things from the first game to the point where it's okay that there's not a lot of conversation because you get an idea of the type of woman that she is. Just her just, small little inflections yeah, of little, like seeing like a top shelf and being like, oh, nothing's on the... Oh, wait a minute. Wait, there is something back here. What? Oh, it's a bottle. Like, that's... So, I love that. I genuinely or, love that. You're, you'll go to like dry fields, the second location in the desert, and there's a bunch of uh, photos of a bunch of like famous Western people, and she'll comment about like them and like talk about things about herself. And I just like love those little touches about, you know, here we have um, just like environmental storytelling in a different way um versus like here's a narrative that's being forced on you yes. or you know that this character is the badass character no you get to see like Aya be kind of like this full fully fleshed human being you yes. get to see her anxiety but you also get to see like how willingly she will jump into danger to save the day and it's all because of the things around her in the world yes one of my very one one very specific instance of that that i really really enjoyed that i actually didn't Notice in Dryfield when Douglas first uh, sends you up to her motel room, and you get into the bathroom. My first playthrough, I didn't, I didn't go into that bathroom. I just went straight outside. And this playthrough, I went into the bathroom, and when you look, when you examine the mirror, um, Aya goes into this kind of small monologue, kind of reflecting on. She's looking at herself in the mirror and noticing she still looks 20 years old. That's because of, you know, Eve's mitochondria is like inside her and a host wants a nice young body. And so she's reflecting on it's crazy that I'm looking in the mirror and seeing myself knowing that I'm aging, but not seeing myself age and her basically being like, you know, I don't want to live forever. I would like to be able to grow old and, you know, kind of have a life similar like to Like a, a normal else. life, yeah. Yeah, and I just, that characterization alone was honestly more, it, it was more characterization than we got from any uh, interaction that she had with another character in the game. And in either of the games, like, we're disregarding the third one because nobody wants to talk about the, that. The third what? Yeah, exactly. Um, but, like, <laughs> I think... This I don't see I don't get a good grasp of a lot of Square Enix characters. I think we fall in love with them um, based on their design and oh, the absolutely. things that they go through, but we don't always uh, relate to them based on the tons of things she say uh, they say and like the fact that she says so much or thinks so much. I think it's cool. We don't get to pull that back and really get into the head of a character. Um, yeah. And speaking of the setting, too, uh, I think it follows a pretty standard affair of a survival horror where you start in, like, a city-esque vibe, and then you end up in a lab, inevitably. Um, I always do think that labs are overdone, but yeah, I really, really like, A, the fact that you're in the this, like, New York Tower at the very beginning of the game. I think it's really cool. And then Dryfield is a really neat way to have this environment to explore. Um, because like the desert is just so mysterious. Mm -hmm. And you know, you wouldn't think like I'm, you know, there's this little conclave of people that used to live in this motel. It's almost like a uh, post-apocalyptic shits creek <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's so i have i have a little bit of feelings about kind of like the locales and how they kind of pace it throughout the game because when i first started my playthrough when you rock up to acropolis tower um and the camera angles do that crazy like it's still pre-rendered backgrounds but it's shifting around Aya as she's moving up that was incredibly cinematic oh, with, the, with the fire in the background yeah. the and helicopter down we don't we don't see it again which is you know a little unfortunate but Acropolis Tower like my bounty um my bounty mode playthrough that I'm that I just started um, I got through that area in like basically like an, an hour because like, you know, I, you know, I, I was more familiar with everything. I knew where, where everything was, but it made me realize that 
you know, we really don't spend very much time in a city setting at all, which for me, I really enjoyed how um, the first game was kind of just just all city, all different kind of parts of a city. I know mm -hmm. that they could have done more with the locales um, within that, you know, those different city environments, but I really liked the consistency. And like you said, you know, we don't get to see a lot of, um, you know, modern day settings in these types of, ga types of games. And I definitely don't mind dry field um, as a location. I think it's a really cool and fun juxtaposition to you know that that city setting but i wish there had been more of the city because like she's in la it's a totally new city environment we barely sure. even get to see we barely get to see most of the acropolis tower um like all, none of the elevators work we're basically just designated to you know that area where everything in the story happens well you have to think about it too like uh the first game in new york uh, it's very, it's like populated until creatures appear and then it's not populated. Um, and I think it, it, it has that like apocalypse feel where just everyone is gone. But I think what makes dry field really interesting, cause it, you know, recreating that, especially with higher fidelity graphics or being able to push the bill a little bit more. I don't know if it would have hit as hard because they couldn't do it as much justice, but going somewhere that's already vacant, you know, like, and then throwing in monsters up top on top of it. I feel like it adds that like, Oh man, I don't know what's around the corner. You know, like th this place would be creepy even if we didn't have like mitochondria beasts everywhere oh for sure the whole rundown um aesthetic of it uh was I, I definitely felt the vibes when you first rock up in in her in her car like um, as a kid when you have that one part where you meet douglas and then a woman starts screaming yes uh, yes and is continuing I, to really, scream for yeah. the entirety of when you have to go run back and get the tools to open up the the secret dresser and she's still screaming the whole like time. is it annoying <laughs> yes it, it kind of pulls you out of the it pulls you out of the you know the suspension of disbelief a little bit because of like okay if this woman is this woman getting murdered for like 35 minutes straight like or is she having a good time for 30 minutes <laughs> exactly no, uh but but as a kid like that really freaked me out because oh, for you sure. know it's like so creepy <laughs> no no one else is supposed to to be here like douglas mm -hmm. and everybody everyone's gone and you know there's another person here so i i just i think it's cool seeing that you know it's almost like the spencer mansion in resident evil 1 or the um police station resident evil 2 where you have this like believably contained place like this little motel shop general shop area where like a couple of poor people probably live um they live out of a hotel and like these are the lives they that they live and it's almost like those other settings because like you could make some really weird shit happen there and some obviously weird shit does oh yeah and i do i do really appreciate the game's insistence on <laughs> um especially in the beginning like the first couple of areas like they love to use their like fmvs to um to just show the like just normal everyday people like transforming into i mean there's there's a reason that the the, <laughs> the game is two discs and it's probably from oh like, yeah <laughs> the three fmvs yeah the thing that that uh really you know skeeved me out so much about the first game was uh so many people you see so many civilians affected by eve like you see a bunch of people burst into flames you see a bunch of people turn into goop and the in parasite eve 2 the most that you really see of that is in Acro acropolis tower when you see the whole swat team has been wiped out and just completely like mutilated and then from there you have a couple of instances of normal civilians who are just guy hanging out 
turning, you know, into the uh, mitochondria creatures. And then past Dryfield, it's pretty much exclusively just monsters. And it's like, I know that Aya's characterization through her exploration definitely gives way more than I feel like, you know, any, any actual interaction with other characters would have, you know, brought. But it feels very isolating, which might have been the, you know, the the point to kind of make Aya feel a lot more isolated than she did in the first game. But it just kind of like there's something about only seeing a couple of humans up until pretty much the end where the army just rocks up out of nowhere. Um, it just, it just, it was a little bit, just the pacing of it all, um, just kind of like, sort of took me out of well, the experience. Think of it this way too, in the first game, like, I is just a police officer and shit just happens to her, you know what I this mean? This is true. Like, it, and now, she is a part of an org organization that is supposed to be controlling the shit that happens, and she's probably the best because she's Superwoman. So it makes sense that she is alone because I don't think she would be able to do what she does if other people were around. And there's also the That's fact, fair. like like you said, the creatures in the first game are all animals for yes, the most yes, part. Yes, yes, Where a lot of the creatures in this game are like experiments on humans. So mm -hmm. you like you if you met someone or if there were several people, you don't know if you can trust them because you don't know if you wouldn't know if you they'd transform or not. So that's also fair. I almost feel like there that's that purpose. Like yes, isolation video game. If there's a lot of people, is it believable? But like I think it kind of fits that narrative too. Mm -hmm. My issue with just the pacing of everything is that while I really like Dryfield as a location, I feel like too much of the game is spent in it. I'm I'm personally not a huge fan of backtracking type puzzles like that's just me if y'all are into it that's like totally no, i don't, I don't think anyone cool. is but i think people <laughs> just also know it's a product of the time yeah you know and I mean? and also i really do feel like a lot of the puzzle stuff which is like you really gotta rack your brain for some of these things i really feel like these companies were you know kind of doing this with the intention of giving the player more incentive to buy the player's guide absolutely yeah. and i mean i i grew out of being a player's guide person but mm -hmm. i was definitely a player's guide kid oh me too and i i know that um i would not be someone who would just like be glued to it but uh this was a game where i appreciated having it just because even though there were some things that were just wrong in it um mm -hmm. but it was nice to have because some of the puzzles were stumpers but it was also nice to have little information on like what the weapons could do or what the parasite energy could do and i actually oh, want yeah. to talk about like equipment now i think mm -hmm. this is like a good place since you you kind of hinted at it there too um when we met, um, we were talking a little bit about Parasite Eve 1 versus Parasite Eve 2. And we were talking about the the number of guns in Parasite Eve 1. And there's just so many of them. And they're just a bunch of like blobs of letters and numbers. But here, even the fact that you have images for your armor, your weapons, and you have very brief descriptions of ev what everything does, I appreciate that. I feel appreciate that it's like a little bit more curated and streamlined as opposed to just like next gun stat go up go boom you know oh for sure and the ui and pe2 oh my god so much like nicer to look at so much nicer to um traverse and use yeah, it's 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 fun when you get like a key item or or just something new in general. Like the game forces you anything you, time you pick up something new to press triangle and investigate it and like get the description of it. Like I yes, think that's really yeah. good, even if it's like a, a can of Coca Cola, you know, like which is funny that it's in there. It was that weird, uh, or is it Pepsi or is it Coke? Which is funny. Which is funny. I. 
I didn't realize that you could just examine things. I thought that you just have to use the item if it has a question mark on it. Oh, no. So I would just randomly, I would pick up a, a question mark item that ended up being a health item once I pushed X on it and I used it as a health item. And I was like, I only was missing two health points and didn't need to use that. Whoops. <laughs> well, now now you know. <laughs> now I, and that's, that's another thing is that... Um, there's a lot that I really do not know about just from my first playthrough because um, initially I was going to say, yeah, but I really liked how PE1 had like so many guns and it doesn't feel like PE2 has many guns. I looked up the wiki and there's a buttload of guns yeah, in there are, Parasite there are, 2. There's a and good number. I barely, I barely came across any of them in my, in my first playthrough. And I do understand now that... A lot of them are obtained through very specific means, which, you know, probably also, you know, that's some player's guide shit. Um, because, like, you know, unless you are playing through this game, like, at, you know, upwards of, like, I would say, like, six to ten times, you know, I can't imagine you're going to be able to get everything because a lot of it also has to do with um, your game rank. And it's like when you finish a game, your overall rank in the game is going to determine you having access to a certain weapon in your next playthrough. And that doesn't even have to do with just getting the best rank. Yeah, like the, I think the the gun, the gun blade from Final Fantasy VIII, like I think is the that's, you see, like, that's the, the, a or that's, the, the S. S. that's the S. Yeah, one. like yes. you have to get an S rank. So I agree with that. You know, you're right. Like there are things like I feel like I know the game really well, mm -hmm. but I I missed the free shotgun because in Acropolis Tower, there's the person who's uh, putting in the explosive, and right. if you search, it's hard to see. But if you search like right where they are, there's a key card that you can use there later on in the game uh, when you get to the lab that opens up a, the back part of the armory. See, and you that's get, that's you the get, other the other you thing, get the free the, shotgun. The there. exploration for me. Which kind of, real quick, okay, I am going to uh, dig up uh, the grave of my gripes with tank controls for just a sure. second. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're, we're back. It did not take long. <laughs> the, the thing with exploration in PE was that all you had to do was just, you know, move the control stick around and, you know, just keep mashing A until you found stuff with the tank controls. I feel like I have to keep rotating Aya very slightly um, because there are some places where if she is not angled just right over it, she will not examine the thing. And that could be an item that you're missing. That could be a whole weapon that you're missing. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard it is the hard thing about doing the pre-rendered backgrounds and the perspective the way they do yeah. it where, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to, you know, get the, the correct which, angle. Yeah, I which agree. like, I, I just, you know, I just, it's a bummer that I feel like because I'm 32. I do not have time to play Parasite Eve 2 like six plus times to like find everything that I can find. That but I'm that's sure the beauty of old games. Yeah. There were no there were no <laughs> trophies, so you didn't have to worry about completing it. You could just be done with it the first. But time. but but that's see, I'm not a, a big completionist in terms of like doing certain things. But like if there are weapons or armor and stuff that you can get that are easy to miss. That that kind of bums me out a little bit. Like like yeah. straight looking through the wiki for all like of like that. Uh, the fr a free too. shotgun is yeah. definitely a nice there's a, thing. There's a there's a there's a um a revolving grenade launcher that you can. There's a magnum. Oh yeah, there I is like a let's, ton let's, of attachments. <laughs> let's talk about this too. So uh, I guess I want to hear from you, strategy wise. Where did you find yourself leaning in terms of the guns and the parasite of energy that you would use the most? Like, and I know that. Obviously, you didn't get to experience everything, so that's the caveat. But I'm curious, like, what what was working for you in terms of your loadout? So, uh, v initially, you know, I got my hands on the, I believe I got my hands on the shotgun. I might have gotten the um the early game shotgun. Was it three then, shots or was it like eight shots? I think it was like three. Okay, so yeah, that's the early game shotgun. Yes, and so what happened was I got through. Honestly, the majority of the game with, I think I did, I think I did upgrade, um, the pistol to the, you know, German Mauser, uh, looking thing. Oh, the, the, the crit beast? Yes, yes, I did, I did upgrade to that, but then pretty much just stuck with that initial, um, shotgun, 
and I I did that way throughout dry field, way throughout the shelter, way throughout um uh into the lab and pretty far into the lab. Like I oh, the was... shotgun the shotgun carries for sure, and I think a part of it is because you get the varying ammo. Like I did not miss many of the guns and. Yeah, like I had the assault rifle, for, which I would use for a lot of it. But even still, when you're fighting against those things that are in the water, um, that pop up and sh like shoot lightning at you, they're weak against fire. I would still go back and get my old shotgun and put on the firefly rounds to to knock them out because it would do so much more damage than a grenade would. So like that, it's the shotgun. The shotgun's just so versatile. See, but see, the thing is, that was not a personal choice of mine. Like, that... It's just your so, only option. Well, because, so, you know, you, you buy from Douglas the first time, and I had, like, you know, done a little bit of sleuthing to be like, you know, oh, you know, the next time, you know, when you go back to Dryfield, which I just assumed that the story was naturally going to take you back to Dryfield. I didn't know about the whole, you know, saving the dog thing. I didn't know about the secret... Did you um, not save the dog? I didn't say no. I didn't save the dog. I, no. I, it took me so long to to beat the burner boss. He was kicking my ass, and so, I know you you need to save him in a certain amount of time. Pro tip. So speaking of loadouts, uh, the necrosis parasite energy basically carries a big chunk of the game. Yeah, because you poison things. Yes. And some things, when they get poisoned, every time the poison ticks, uh, they they stun. And some enemies just completely get stun locked from it for no, as long see, as yeah, it lasts. Yeah, I, I I knew none of that. I got pretty much all the way up until um, the like the Aztec pyramid section before I realized that there's an armory in the lab. I completely passed the armory in the oh, lab. No. So I was going through with all of my very early game stuff up until pretty close to the end of the game until I looked it up, went fuck, went to uh the lab armory, got the assault rifle, got all of the different attachments, got the grenade uh, pistol, got all of the different ammo, and then I rocked out of that out of that armory being like, let's go, and I destroyed everything. And that felt great, but I completely missed a huge portion of the game because the game just it's easy to miss if you're, you know, not specifically looking for it. And the it game is, but that's, yeah. but that's kind of the, the beauty of it too. Where like, you know, uh, there are some windows in the game that I don't agree with where if you don't do something at a certain time, you're locked out. And, it's, and it's very just, it's specific. A, yeah, it's very specific. It's a very narrow window. But at the same time too, like to think that there are multiple ways to experience the game or that like you can find new areas to explore i appreciate the concept yeah. absolutely appreciate yeah. the concept and i definitely have i have a more i have more of a respect for the overall concept of the game i'm just i'm a little salty because you know there's all these guns that i missed i think it's i think it's one of those things too if you have a style, you just run with your style. Like, you can obviously look at any guide and they're going to be like, use energy ball and win. And like, that's that's all energy ball, energy shot, everything. And you can do that, but you don't have to do that. And I think that's the nice thing about this game where you got through with basically a minimalist <laughs> I, run. I put all and, of and my experience into healing and fireball and that's and I basically think that's, all i used <laughs> but even fireball still stomps on for sure. the, the right creatures and like it's cool to, to see the way that little things interact like there are some monsters that if you have the lightning attachment to the assault rifle they just makes them explode in one hit oh, or awesome. those uh those caterpillar enemies that you fight if you hit yes. them with any fire they get like singed and then they just like take burn damage every second very quickly like mm -hmm. there's just a lot of different ways to that the game like it's just again those little fun details um that you might not even see in a standard um survival horror game that kind of make it fun okay i've got two other ways that i kind of want to hit this uh mm -hmm. before we wrap up i want to talk about what was your favorite boss what was your least favorite boss we don't have to go too heavy into it and then i want to talk about like any last notes or like 
is this game still worth it? But let, let's hit the the bosses first. What was one boss where like that boss is fucking cool? And then what was one of the bosses where you just kind of like, I don't know, like this was not, it was either a tough time or it was not a good time. Probably as as I I enjoyed I enjoyed the burner. I did enjoy the burner's like design. I know it's like very like a lot of the bosses in P2 are very ridiculous. Um yes, just yes, like super very... over the top. Um but I the introduction like the FMV intro to the burner was just like this thing just like Oh, oh my god, and just, like, a, a, a flamethrower just, like, coming out of its, like, way too big mouth, and, um... A lot yeah. of the bosses in, in 2 are nonsensical compared to the first game, where the first game kind of fits, like, that, uh... Uh, here's this thing that has mutated, and of course it looks crazy, but, like... You know, which is like a bigger version of it, or has three heads now and it shoots a laser beam from the center one. Whereas, whereas, like you're saying, PE two with the, you, it literally has a flamethrower. Like, why? Yeah, which is like I, I enjoy that kind of like that bio horror type, like techno horror kind of um, cut like collashing with you know uh, the boss designs and stuff like that. Um, I really didn't care for number nine as um a boss like a like the, a reoccurring boss i think the first time you fight him that's kind of cool because there are yes, a lot of yes. environmental ways that you can like deal with that like shooting the things in the wall but the second time you fight him i know how to if you have like when you redo that battle if you have the shotgun and then you have oh what are the shotgun shells that you get they're not the firefly, uh, the, they're where the, other the, the R slugs. Yeah, if you get the R slugs, mm -hmm. because he's an armored unit, and you do energy, if you have energy shot level two, you have enough shots to beat him without having to switch weapons. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and just in general, like, the golems, I, I'm not crazy about uh, just kind of this whole, like, super soldier, this mutant super soldier type enemy i think i think if the design had been more mutated and not just this is a really strong mutated guy in a suit i think i would have enjoyed it more but i think it just kind of it threw me off from kind of the mostly kind of like crazy cronenberg monster designs that the majority See, i thought of the game i thought it was kind of, they were kind of cool i and thought especially <laughs> the different the different ways that you can beat them too like if you're fighting against two of them and they're the ones that have the little like rockets that they shoot at you you, mm. you can totally have one hit the other one with the rockets and i like the design philosophy of fighting them yeah i, I, I appreciate but i agree that. They, they definitely seem like they're in a random space i will always like the flame lurker boss um i think he is really cool i think it's the first time you feel like you're fighting a true parasite eve boss in that game which you one know, was the flame the, lurker they're the, the big guy the, with the flamethrower oh well, i said flame i've said flame lurker i'm thinking demon souls but yeah the oh, big, okay <laughs> the flamethrower guy and like um there's just some cool things that happen in that battle like even if you don't poison him if you can beat him on time uh like the first part you know you blow off his head if he mm -hmm. grabs you and like the top half of his head is gone um he is like doing damage because he's squeezing you but you can actually shoot him in that moment and do mm -hmm. triple damage like there are just a lot of cool really cool moments that happen in and that. i did i did really like the final boss i really like the two-parter of the giant crazy blob mm -hmm. eye thing where you have to like shoot off all of its different parts and just like how you have to like un you have to outrun the like eye beam or else it's almost a one hit kill if your like HP is too low. Yeah. Um and then definitely that scale turning... scales up in a difficulty the more you take out for sure. Oh yeah. But then th I actually found out, which I don't know if you knew this, but um the second phase where it combines with Clone Eve, the amount that you take off of the first um phase um so the amount of like body parts that you uh that you destroy um before destroying the eye that actually takes off 
a max amount of HP from the second phase when she's like E mode. Oh, that's mode. cool. No, I didn't yeah. know that. Which I realized I'm. that's probably why she was so easy for me to beat because I spent so much time blowing off all of the first phase's parts and then really all it took was just like infinite uh, grenade launcher shots to like disrupt her from doing the whole um mp steel move that she does and yeah i really i took her down it took me like 50 tries to do the first phase it took me maybe five to get the second phase down i must not have noticed because i was too busy using that 12 shot grenade launcher that you were talking about <laughs> Um, but jealous. anyway, okay, <laughs> to wrap this up, let's talk about is this game still worth it? And if so, who is this game for? I always like ending a conversation on this because I think it's good for people to know, like, do you think you can still get something out of playing this? And if so, uh, like, who and what? I think that it is absolutely, like, worth playing. I, I think if... In general, if you are just already a fan of survival horror games and, like, are totally used to um, tank controls and the switching camera angles and, like, inventory management, puzzles, backtracking, exploration, etc., I, I think I think people who enjoy that genre in general, I think, would get a lot of mileage out of this game. I think people who have played the first game and are weary about this game because of the juxtaposition between the two, I think should still give it a shot, because I think I almost see it as more of a reimagining of, you know, the Parasite Eve um, franchise, um, I think that the amount of specific mechanics that go into combat definitely, like, led to a lot of replayability, a lot of the different modes that you can do that, um, after your first mode, you know, you'll have a lot of replayability with different, um, different variables that you have to face, uh, lend a lot of replayability, um, yeah, I, the story, I think it you can take or leave. <laughs> I definitely agree with you. I think like this game is built in mind for a lot of different playstyles. You can squeeze a lot out of it and try and get at every encounter. And if you like that kind of like hunting monsters, getting better gear, or you can full on survival mode it and try and get through with the minimum amount as possible. Mm -hmm. I think adding magic to uh, a game like this is uh, an, in an interesting take for sure. And of course, like it's not that this, this genre will never be a narrative heavy game, but I do think that I like, or strong, like I don't think it's ever gonna be strong, but I do right. think you get some good characterization, which kind of makes up for it and makes it interesting. So I would say like, should this be at the top of your list? No, but if you're looking for something that's like unique and that's a genre splice and we don't really see any games like this, like I cannot name too many that spice oh, up. I, this. I cannot think of another game that plays like this game. Yeah, so it's I, like if you want something unique, I would recommend it. Absolutely. So, yeah, I definitely think so. But Asters, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this with me. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a fun yeah. time cool and it was a good time just like thank you for trusting me in approaching this game because i know it's gonna, <laughs> that could be a big risk T time is the the biggest uh uh resource that we don't always want to have to spend so the fact that you did get some enjoyment out of it is it makes me happy so thank you well, we would love to hear your thoughts uh, on this video and what you thought of this game. Obviously, keep it constructive and positive. If you don't like the game, don't blame us. It's cool. It's okay if we all have different <laughs> opinions. But sound off on the comments. We'd love to hear what you think. Give us a like and a subscribe. And if you want to be a uh, part of the conversation on all the things that we do at RP Gamer, head on over to our Discord at Hey RP Gamer. The link we have is probably somewhere on our community page. Uh, we'd love for you to join our community. We talk about video games every day. And who knows? Maybe at some point you will jump on in a ver an episode of your very own. What? <laughs> but for now... Thank you for listening. Have a good one and go out there and get gaming.